Hey guys, Quip the Lazy Geek here and welcome back to the channel. Today we are going to talk about the Dwarf Lab Dwarf 2 telescope, that uh, little uh, tracking uh, smart scope that I have uh, tested on the channel previously and I will uh, keep testing on the channel. But more specifically, we are going to talk about the filters that come with this little telescope if you've ordered it in the deluxe version. So first thing, for those who don't know, this is a small smart telescope that can be used for like during the day, but also like for astrophotography, where it will automatically point to interesting astrophotography targets like nebulae or galaxies and take pictures of them so you can view the results on your smartphone immediately. It's pretty cool. And it's also uh, fairly cheap, uh, at least compared to similar offerings. I think like the base version right now is like $400 and the version with the filters is $500. I'll uh, put links down in the description to other videos where I have, you know, looked at the telescope and my next step for testing this scope, by the way, will be to take it in an area with less light pollution because yes, I am in Tokyo, Japan and Tokyo, Japan does tend to have a lot of light pollution. Light pollution is bad for astronomy and astrophotography. Okay, going back to those three filters. If you have the deluxe version, you received those three filters. What are they? So there is a blue, green, purplish, weird kind of like reflective colored filter here that is um, available in the telescope. And this is your ultra high contrast filter. Uh, this is made for astrophotography, specifically astrophotography. And uh, we will look later in this video at what it is uh, useful for based on the actual spectrum diagram of the filter. So hang on until later in the video. The two other filters that we have here, ah, sorry, the two other, other filters that we have here are um, ND filters. They're basically attenuation filters for lights. They let only like one millionth of the light. And so because of that, they are meant really for uh, taking images of the sun. Uh, because since uh, you have like on the dwarf telescope, this lens here is a 100 millimeters focal length. If I were to point it at the sun directly, I'm afraid it would directly and immediately damage the uh, sensor inside because the light from the sun would be focused on the sensor. If you've ever had fun with a magnifying glass and the sun trying to burn things up, I sure did as a kid because I'm a weird kid, uh, <laughs> you know what, what would happen to the sensor. So we have those two dark, very, very dark uh, filters and the, the telescope should have also been provided with this uh, filter holder. So the only thing to do is if you want to look at the sun with the telescope, you just screw in those filters on the filter holder and the filter holder can be magne magnetically magnet can be attached to the telescope via magnets. <laughs> okay, and now it's time for me to point this at the sun and see how it looks like. But before you do that, if you want to support me and the channel, feel free to go down below, like the video, leave a comment, subscribe, or if you want to support me a lot, you could even consider joining my Patreon. Link down in the description below. My Patreon subscribers get access uh, a bit early to all of my videos without ads, and also some exclusive uh, processing, unedited and uncut videos. If that sounds interesting, well, you can go and have a look. Okay, so one of the things with sun and if you want to image the sun and look at the sun via this telescope is to never forget to put the, those two lenses on first and to never look at the sun without appropriate eye protection otherwise you can severely damage your eyes and you only have two eyes and you can't replace them so seriously don't look at the sun directly but that does mean that it makes it slightly difficult to center the sun on the little telescope there and there is um, a trick with that is simply uh, using the joystick like I have here on uh, on the little telescope what I can do is look at the telescope shadow that is projected for me on the ground and basically I want the shadow to be um, so that the telescope here is completely facing the sun so when it becomes a nice rectangle that is no, no longer kind of like slanted I know that I am properly uh, facing the sun at least in um, in the, uh, the horizontal kind of uh, direction. So then the next step would be to just adjust the 
angle that the lens is pointing at, so the altitude of the, uh, of the lens, to find the sun. And for that, you can use the wide angle lens that is there. You can see on my screen, I have on the top left, the wide angle lens, and I already see the sun. So I can uh, simply move it, and I'm going to lower the speed uh, of, the, uh, of the tracking here, move it to uh, find the sun. And here we have it. I have the sun visible in uh, in my screen. So now it's a bit uh, too bright. So what I want to do is uh, play with the uh, settings that I have in here. So probably, yeah, put the shutter speed to a manual low speed. And here we can see that the sun immediately becomes uh, slightly more visible. And there, but unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, dark spots today. Let me try some autofocus. And yes, we actually do see some dark spots there. This is kind of fun. But basically, that is like the main use that at least I can see for those ND filters. Remember, as long as the telescope is pointing at the sun, you really want to make sure that those two filters are attached to the telescope. You never want to be like, oh, the sun is nice. I looked at the sun, it was cool, and remove it before you point the telescope somewhere else. I'm just going to manually point it away from the sun, and now I can remove the two filters. Now, the next filter that I want to look at is the ultra high contrast filter. The way to mount it is that you want to mount it typically not on the wide angle lens, but on the telephoto lens, which is uh, nicely written on there. So it's just the same as before. You screw it on the uh, telephoto lens side of things. And once you've done so, you can uh, apply basically the uh, filter holder to the uh, telescope. And that's pretty much it. This, this filter is definitely not made for solar observation, so don't get confused. Do not point the telescope as it is right now to the sun. It could uh, damage it, I believe. Uh, but this would, in theory, be useful for nebulae. And the way uh, that it works is that it would only let in some uh, slices of color that are relevant for emission nebulae, like the Great Orion Nebula, and, and block other colors that would let in basically only or uh, mostly just light pollution. And so it helps get more contrast between like nebulae features and the uh, background sky because it removes a lot of the light pollution, which is a good thing in theory. So what's pretty cool though, is that I happen to own a tool, a machine called a spectrometer that lets me actually measure the uh, color response of this particular filter. So I can double check which colors does this filter pass? And so how does it work theoretically? I also received from one of my subscribers the theoretical uh, color response of this, this uh, uh, filter, he got it by simply asking Dwarf Lab and they provided the data. So we'll be able to look at it. And so let's have a look at both the theoretical curve and then the measurement of my particular filter. Okay, and first let's look at the data about this ultra high contrast uh, UHC filter that's been provided uh, to one of my subscribers by uh, Dwarf Lab. And hard to read this chart, which is based on the raw data that you have here on the left-hand side. Uh, so basically the y-axis here from zero to 100 is just the percentage of light transmission. So when you're around 100%, it means you're transferring a lot of light. When you're at around 0%, you're blocking most of the light and you're transmitting almost none of it, right? So, and then the x-axis is the wavelengths of light, or in other words, the color of the light that you let, let through. So effectively, when you look at this, you can see that this filter will let some color through and block some others and let some more through. Uh, so it's fairly simple to understand. And basically, if I kind of oversimplify the range between 400 nanometers here and 700 nanometers is the visible spectrum roughly. And like at around 500 nanometers here, it's like kind of blue green color at around 650 nanometers and higher, you get into really deep red and like some around 700 nanometers and higher, you are in near infrared, which means that it's not 
our eyes are not sensitive to, uh, to that, but the camera sensor can be. So here we can see that uh, we have this ultra high contrast filter will let through some light in the blue, blue green uh, area. And it will also let some light of deep red color. And there's a very good logic for that. Uh, at around 500 uh, nanometers, 500.7 nanometers to be precise, there is um, a very specific color that is uh, emitted by uh, ionized oxygen in nebulae, um, in emission nebulae, like the Great Orion Nebula or the California Nebula, the North American Nebula, the Rosette Nebula, all of those nebula, uh, typically they have like a, a strong emission at around that wavelength. So it makes sense that we want to let it through. Um, and most nebulas, they don't really have any interesting uh, emissions here at the um, at the 550, 600 nanometers mark. Um, and again, with nebula, you have hydrogen emissions. And one of the main hydrogen emissions is uh, uh, at 656.3, if I remember correctly, nanometers, it's H alpha. And you can see that the filter is designed to let through H alpha, H alpha quite well. So that's why this filter is ultra high contrast. It takes in like the um, band passes, the colors uh, that are important for at least emission nebulae targets, and it discards others. So the light pollution that would have otherwise come into the dwarf two at around this 500 nanometer, 600 nanometer colors is completely blocked. And because there's no, not so much relevant signal uh, from the targets that we want to capture, so from emission nebulae, then you know it means that we are just canceling out light pollution without losing much signal. So it's uh, you know all profit uh, for us. That said, this is really good for nebulae, but for a, a lot of other uh, celestial objects that you want to image, uh, such as um, uh, star clusters, are what we call reflection nebulae, which don't emit any light on their own. They just reflect light from neighboring uh, stars, like the Pleiades cluster, or even like galaxies. Um, it it's sometimes and most of the time it it's better to just like let the light through along with the light pollution because there's still a lot of signal in this area around 550 600 uh, nanometers. Um, so yeah, so we can see the logic here. I think that if the um, ultra high contrast uh, filter provided by Dwarf Lab indeed uh, matches those specifications. I would personally use it for emission nebulae, uh, but I would not use it for other targets. I would limit myself to just emission nebulae with uh, that filter, and it would be quite useful for, uh, for that. Uh, for other targets, even galaxies, um, I would go with just like no filter at all. And, um, and it all another reason it's that in the end, it makes uh, color calibration, if you intend to actually process your images, easier without the ultra high contrast uh, filter. Uh, we also see that it's uh, sensitive in the near infrared. So it lets quite a bit of light go through in the near and even further uh, infrared. And this, the impact that this has on us really completely depends on the actual frequency response or wavelength response response of the actual IMX415 uh, sensor that is in the Dwarf 2 telescope. And I do not have this available at this time, so I, I cannot really say how uh, much impact we get. Okay, but that said, with my own spectrometer, what, how does my own UHC filter provided by Dwarf Lab um, actually work? Let's have a look. And here we are. So I want to stress that like anything below 400 is, is not trustworthy. So you can ignore like this weird blob on the left. Uh, but basically you can look at the curve and in terms of shape, we have, it's exactly the same thing as before. We have the transmission at the, uh, at the Y axis and the X axis is our wavelengths. And uh, my wavelength is only trustable uh, up to yeah, around 750 nanometers. So I cannot go 
all the way to 1,100 nanometers that they measured for the filter. But, you know, at first glance, it looks like the filter uh, matches their specifications. Um, and we can see that around 500 nanometers, we have like this, this wide uh, transmission uh, bandpass here, exactly per their specifications. Where things start to get dodgy with my own filter is that the second bump, the second transmission area, is supposed to start a bit before 650 nanometers. But in my case, it actually starts rising at around 670 nanometers. You can see the red cross right now is at 671 nanometers. And we finally reach good transmission at around 695 nanometers. Unfortunately, this means that the, my particular filter is bad, bordering on unusable. Uh, the reason being that the main signal emitted by emission nebula is around here, where the red cross here is. So at 656 nanometers. And you can see that my own ultra high contrast filter does not pass any light or barely any light at that wavelength, which means that if I were to try to use it for emission nebulae, I would be losing like the, the strongest signal from the nebula that I can capture, which is H alpha. So it's absolutely counterproductive. So um, I'll be providing those results to uh, Dwarf Lab uh, as well, just so that you, they can uh, they can see uh, this issue. I do not know whether it is my own filter only that is um, affected, uh, but yeah, this is something to uh, to really keep in mind. So as you can see, my particular UHC filter is worse than useless, literally worse than useless. I'll be better off uh, without the filter than with the filter. So is it only my sample that is affected? Was there a whole lot of filters that were affected? Are other people besides myself affected? I have no idea. And I haven't discussed this with Dwarf Lab up to now. My guess, and this is purely a guess, is that they're sourcing this filter from another manufacturer. And uh, that manufacturer probably needs to be contacted to tell them that something is wrong. Um, unfortunately, this is something that I've seen with a lot of even much more expensive astrophotography filters, filters that do not match the theoretical specifications. And it is very difficult for end users to actually check much much less prove that the filter is defective and does not perform to specs. And this is one of the reasons why I spent money to buy a spectrophotometer, that machine that lets me double check that the filters are performing as expected. In my case, it isn't. Um, and I'm worried that it could be the case for other buyers of the Dwarf Lab telescope. Quit from the future here, and I just want to give you very brief test results of the filter on the Orion Nebula M42, and to show you what the issue will look like, and you know, so that if you have the uh, filter on hand and you want to double check that it's working, you can do so. So I used, uh, you want to use the um, stacking feature in uh, Dwarf. Uh, in the Dwarf 2. And here I have only three frames of 10 seconds each uh, stacked on M42. And this is without any filter. And we can see a lot of details in here as well. We can see like the arc of M42 kind of like well here. We see the arc there continuing all around. And there's like a bit of detail here in the middle. Okay. Now, right afterwards, as M42 was rising, so in theory, the conditions from are getting better, I did the same three times 10 seconds stacked with the filter on. And as expected, I see much fewer details. Um, this arc is actually fairly visible, but it stops earlier. And the details that I was seeing earlier here are not visible. Um, and this is simply because of the issue that the filter uh, unfortunately doesn't capture H alpha, uh, which is a, a big, big, large component of the uh, M42 nebulosity. So yeah, um, it, that means for me, it's obviously better to just image without the filter than with the filter, with the, the result being, uh, being this. Uh, okay, so hopefully this is a method that you can also use to double check uh, your own filter, see if you have uh, any issues with it. Uh, so that's a big problem. 
uh, it's not such a big problem for me because personally I don't use this kind of ultra high contrast filters. I prefer to use uh, what I call dual band narrow band filter. An example is the Optolong L Extreme, uh, which are filters that have the same purpose as the ultra high contrast filter, but they let in only much smaller sliver of lights, the only sliver of lights that are relevant for nebulae basically, and they reject a lot more light pollution. So that's what I would be using personally for uh, nebulae rather than the uh, ultra high contrast filter that is provided by Dwarf Lab. The problem being is for other users if who do not know whether their filter is good or not, if they've stumbled on a sample of the filter that's as bad as mine, by using the filter they will get worse results than by not using the filter at all, which is obviously a big issue. Um, and this is because my particular filter does not let through the most important wavelengths for emission nebula, which is the H alpha wavelengths. So that's like, that is unforgivable. Um, and that's, that's really, um, that's a bummer. I mean, it does pass through one of the secondary are less powerful, let's say, signals from nebulae, which is oxygen three at around 500.7 nanometers, and it passes it, and it passes it very, very well. Uh, but yeah, no, that's not cool. And honestly, I don't know how uh, Dwarf Lab can proceed with that, besides trying to identify specific lots of filters that were affected by this, because it's extremely hard on the user side to uh, to actually validate that their filter is performing up to specs or not. The only reason I'm able to do so is because I have a spectrometer. I would also be able to do so based on my own extensive experience of astrophotography. I'll be able to check like, oh, this target should be showing H alpha. It doesn't mean something is wrong is the filter, right? Uh, but for a, a lot of Dwarf lab, lab customers, it might not be so obvious. So yeah, a bit too bad about this. Um, I'll, I'll definitely contact Dwarf Lab on this. Uh, hopefully they'll have the way to deal with and to first estimate the impact of the issue. You know, it's possible that I, I could be the only one affected. After all, I got an early unit, right? So who knows whether the filter itself is an early unit of the filter, you know, fingers crossed. Uh, but if I do receive any news, uh, I'll make sure to, uh, to keep you informed. Uh, up to now, I've been only impressed by Dwarf Lab. They've, they've constantly like listened to my, my feedback and you know enhanced the firmware, um, added features that I requested. I mean really good good handling overall. So I have no doubt that uh, Dwarf Lab will you know will will take care of the filter if they determine that um, uh, uh, the issue is wider than just my single sample here. Fingers crossed. Uh, but yeah, with that, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. So how to use those filters, what they are useful for, and what to be careful of. Maybe that UHT filter is something that you might not be wanting to use uh, until it is clarified that it works well. And even then, I would recommend it only for emission nebulae, not for galaxies or star clusters or planets or the moon. Um, anyway. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, don't forget whenever you can to look up at the stars or at the blue sky here. And uh, I'll see you next time.